this morning, I, I, before we look into the Word, uh, we're just going to watch a short video. As many of you know, we have four values here that um, are just really important to us. Christ, community, compassion, and courage. And uh, when we think about compassion, what we're really thinking about is reaching out to those in need of Jesus, to those who are far from Jesus. And we recognize that that really happens in two different directions, in a local direction and in a global direction. So in the local direction, uh, as my wife said earlier, uh, we look for opportunities to serve or just to be available um, to not just Lakeville, but the surrounding communities. And so when an opportunity comes up, like putting a float in the parade or and handing out tracts when we're doing that, or doing something like the live nativity, that's just like a local opportunity for us to share Jesus. Um, another thing that we're working on uh, with the hurricane having happened uh, a couple of weeks ago, we're trying to quickly formulate an opportunity for you to serve in Florida down in, um, it coming up maybe in January or February. And so Julianne, who oversees our compassion piece, is, is working to see if we can make that happen. But that's more of the local arm of our compassion value. The global piece is where we uh, create a relationship with those who have been called to serve in other parts of the world. And uh, we have created this relationship with the Howards, um, Kathy and John Howard, and uh, they are serving in Mexico. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name of the city that they're in because it, make, it would make no sense to you because it makes no sense to me. In fact, the last time we did this, I asked what time zone they were in. So that shows you just how like, I, you know, in tune I am with all of this. But um, anyway, we've asked them uh, every few months just to kind of put together a video. Uh, if we don't Zoom live with them, we ask them to put together a video just so we can kind of get a better feel for what their day-to-day -day life is like, and then how we can um, better support them and be encouraged to support them in their efforts. So we're gonna go ahead and just watch this short clip, and then uh, we'll, we'll spend some time in God's Word. Kyaku. Kyaku is the Wixartica word for good morning. And good morning, Cornerstone Church. Thank you so much for joining me to talk a little bit about the Wixartica uh, ministry that we're hoping to, to be able to work here in Mexico. The Wixarica are a people group, an unreached people group in the states of Durango and Jalisco and Nayarit in Mexico with a little bit less than one half of one percent of the population has a personal relationship with Jesus. Very needy people and we were able to go and visit them. They live in the mountains and we left Zacateca City and you can see by these arrows where we went uh, down into the state of Durango about a nine-hour trip in order to get into where the people are located. Our team consisted of uh, nine people, and we made the trip into the mountains, as I mentioned, just a very beautiful place, but very difficult as far as driving into where the people are located. This is what some of the roads would look like if you were to come. Uh, you know, dirt roads, a lot of holes in the roads, just hard to get there. One of the things that you would see very often are these signs with uh, bullet holes in them and those holes are sending a special message and that is that we're watching you and that's from the drug cartels that control all of this area as you come in through the mountains you would come to some of the small towns this wixotica town is by the name of el potrero in the valley that you can see below in order to get there you have to go across a river and this is about a one and a half to two foot deep river and you drive your car across and then you would come into the town by the name of El Potrero, a town of the Wixartica, where there are some believers. We went to a second town by the name of St. Bernard, and in this particular town, there are absolutely no believers uh, whatsoever, a place that has a great deal of need, spiritually speaking. We were able to go with some of our Wixartica leaders from the town of Wehukia, a place where I've been able to go and do some leadership training with some of the pastors you can see in this picture. 
Our function to go was to bring food and supplies to the people where in this part of Mexico is very, very needy, don't have a lot of resources. And we also were able to have the Word of God preached to these people in St. Bernard. This was the first time that many of the people in St. Bernard had been able to hear the message of Christ. What a great opportunity that was. And it makes you think, you know, the people are really waiting to hear the message of hope. And we thank you both, uh, your church, so very much for supporting the work here in Mexico so people like the Wixarica can hear the message of Jesus, the message of hope. The scripture tells us, After this I looked, and there was before me a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. This is our hope for the Wixarica and other peoples in Mexico. Isn't that exciting to think that they are reaching into communities where there are people who have literally never heard the name of Jesus? It, it just seems so weird to me to think that that could be a reality, but uh, it certainly is. And, and so what we'll do is next week we will put in your bulletin an envelope that just says Howard offering on it. And if you would like to give and support the Howards uh, in their effort to see your Share Jesus in Mexico. Um, we'll make sure that, that, that the resources that are collected are then forwarded on to them. Well, if you have your Bibles, um, I bet you can guess where we're going to turn this morning. Uh, your Bible probably is starting to open right up to that book, the book of Ephesians. And uh, while you're turning there, just a special thanks to Scott O'Reilly and to Pastor Clint for sharing the word. Uh, they did an awesome job and very encouraging, very challenging. So I appreciate them filling in while uh, Linda and I were away and also to the elders who uh, just really stepped up and, and kept things afloat. And uh, we're very fortunate just to have a, a, a wonderful church family that, that kind of just all gets together and works together and serves together. And um, it, it's good to be able to go away and know that churches in such good hands. So let's just uh, pause for a second and, and just give this time to the Lord. Father, we just want to thank you so much for your grace, for your kindness. And Lord, at the very outset of this uh, worship time, we ask that your Holy Spirit would come and fill this place. And, and we intentionally and by an act of our will, uh, chose to just invite you in. And Lord, we, we want that because we know that it's only by the work of your Spirit that any of us can find life and any of us can change. And so God, we're asking that as your word is, is brought forth this morning, that it would be your Holy Spirit that knits it together with each of our hearts, that, Lord, we would be transformed by your grace and by your mercy. Lord, some of us are here this morning and we're happy, and some of us are here this morning and we're sad, and some of us are here this morning and we're confused and discouraged. And so, Lord, your word tells us that you can meet us wherever we might be at in this journey. And so I ask, Lord, that you would so kindly and graciously do just that today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Rebecca Pipper uh, wrote a book called Stay Salt. Uh, Rebecca Pipper is actually a, a wonderful author to familiarize yourself with. She's, um, she writes a lot about evangelism. But uh, in her book, Stay Salt, she quotes uh, N.T. Wright. And uh, I like these words that, that are quoted. Uh, this is what he says. He says, Jesus' resurrection from the grave is the beginning of God's new project. Not to snatch people away from her, but to colonize earth with the life of heaven. 
Isn't that interesting? Jesus' resurrection from the grave is the beginning of God's new project. Not to just snatch people away from earth, but to colonize, to invade, to take over the earth with the life of heaven. I really like that quote, but it's often made me stop in my own journey and ask this question, how in the world can that really happen? How can God drizzle his love and his joy and his kindness and his peace on this earth when, when mankind is so hardened and so evil and so prideful and just so self-centered? How can he ever use us to, to, to magnify his glory and, 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 and then to just kind of magnify out to those around us who don't know Jesus the very attributes of who God is? Well, it happens when God reaches down from heaven out of his grace and transforms and renovates and revolutionizes our lives, our hearts because of his grace shown to us in Jesus and explained to us through the truth of his word. Holiness, righteousness, glad surrendered to Jesus does not just organically happen in this world. Our sin condition leads us continually downward. And it's only God and his work in us that can flip that direction around and lead us to himself. And so we, we, we see here in chapter 4 as we kind of just continue to journey through this letter that Paul's written to the church in Ephesus. You know, we come to this uh, verse 17 and, and, and following, and just notice what it says. In verse 17, Paul writes these words. He says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Those, the Gentiles were those who were... Um, Everyone that just wasn't following Jesus. The Gentiles were considered those who are lost. And so he says this, he says, This I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you, he says to those in the church, but that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and in holiness. So the, the Apostle Paul here is speaking to those who have received God's gift of salvation made possible by the death and resurrection of, uh, of Jesus, his son. And now notice here that Paul begins to give us this list of behaviors that the Christian life ought to be portraying out. But he won't let us get to that list. You can't get to, the, to those verses, verses 25 through 31, you can't get there until he has you go through verses 
22 through 24. You see, he's not, Paul's not talking about putting on, or just putting on, and, and putting off behaviors as a matter of fact. He's talking about a whole new life transformation and what that's going to look like in the days ahead in your life. Becoming a Christian is being something before it's doing something. Did you hear that? Becoming a Christian is being something before it has anything to do about doing something. It's this comprehensive inner change, not just to how you live, but to how you are now because of what Jesus has done in your life. It's, it, it, this is one of the biggest mistakes that people make, and it's really the, one of the most common mistakes that, 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 that we see all over and over again. When I say it's the biggest, it's the worst, and it's the most common mistake that, that, that people can actually make about Christianity. Because Christianity is not ultimately just becoming more moral. Morality, even Christianity morality, even Jesus-centered ethics is not Christianity. True Christianity is all about the experience personally of receiving a new spiritual heart from the gift of God himself. And so Paul talks here about putting off, letting go of the former ways of life. Why? Because those ways are really contrary to the ways that God has for us. And so he says, put off your old self, that former manner of life that is corrupt. He says, and, and then notice he gives us the recipe for what made that old life old. He says this, this is so interesting. He says, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through what? Deceitful desires. Deceitful desires desires. Now, isn't that interesting? Paul is saying to us that for the Christian, the old way of life, the, the way that we used to live, was fueled by these desires that were simply soaked in deceitfulness. In other words, we could, we could think of it this way. Will sexually explicit activity really satisfy my heart's most inner longing? No. Because the scripture tells us to focus our natural passions on our spouse. Or, will cheating on my taxes really make up for the shortfall that I'm seeing in my savings account? No. Because the scripture tells us that God will provide for all our needs. When I find uh, you know, true, deep, satisfying relationships with others kind of going downhill, do I just kind of buy into that and, and, and kind of just become one of the crowd and, and kind of become deceitful in my own ways? No. Because the scripture says that purposeful living is achieved by living on the truth. So you see, we did, and sometimes we fall back, we live in these deceitful pockets in our lives that define our former way of life. And we do that because sometimes we think we know better than God. Better than his truth. Better than his principles. 
And Paul reminds us that without Jesus leading our lives, we are just corrupt men and women living on the fuel of deceitfulness and lies. Boy, that ought to be a wake-up call. I, I don't know about you, but I cannot stand it when somebody lies to me, when somebody's deceitful with me. That just really, for whatever reason, goes right at my butt. And I, I think Paul knows just how quickly we forget how spiritually lost we really are without this infusion of Jesus and his grace in our lives. I, I, he keeps seeming, Paul seemingly keeps coming back to, in, in this letter to remind us of what lostness looks like. How hard the, the human heart, the spiritual heart, really is from his perspective until he does a greater work in us. Just to recap, you'll remember back in, in, in verse 18, he reminded us that our spiritual heart is just hard. And secondly, this spiritual hardness against God darkens our understanding in all of life. There's God's way of life, there's the world's way of life, and in our lostness, we just default to the world's way, the world's way of defining what, the, what ought to be, and, and so we just have no real understanding that's based on truth. Thirdly, the result of that darkness is ignorance of reality. Imagine that. You see that in verse 18. In other words, I can have all kinds of university degrees, and I can be really, really smart and wise, but I'm actually ignorant if I do not know the divine meaning or the purpose of those facts and how they relate to the greater reality of eternity. It's just fluff. It's just fluff. Fourth, being ignorant of the true value of things in relationship to God in eternity. In my natural self, I bend towards selfishness and greediness and immorality. And you see that in verse 19. My, my desires go after wrong things. Fifth, this leads to a life, it says in verse 17, of futility, which means emptiness and uselessness and pointlessness. How many people do you know that are just kind of wandering through life hoping that maybe just something will click someday and purpose will arise? The sixth layer of our corruption that we see here and the one that really seals our hopelessness without a divine intervention from Jesus, is again mentioned in verse 18, that we are alienated from the life of God. Our hardness, our darkness, our ignorance, our immorality, our useless behavior are really the marks and the motions of living dead men. Living dead men. You see, every one of us, folks, myself included, is in that condition spiritually until the light of the gospel of the glory of Jesus breaks in and melts this hardness and dispels this darkness and unites us to the life of God and makes us new creatures through faith in Christ alone. Now, when God intervenes in our lives, when he steers the water in our souls, and we begin to become aware that something is missing and that, and that someone is Jesus, when the light goes on in our hearts and in our minds and God begins to move 
deep inside and through his word. And when we begin to see that only Jesus can bring us forgiveness, only Jesus can bring us righteousness, and when we experience that only Jesus can begin to point us towards this new life that he has for us, when all of that begins to happen inside of our hearts, our hard hearts begin to soften. And we begin to be pointed in a new direction. You have to understand that doesn't just happen organically. It only happens by the grace of God. You see, we're not just hard. We're not just fallen. The Bible says that spiritually, we are dead. And so it takes the intervention of Jesus by his spirit, through the truth of his word, to come in and begin to turn this light on. We call that regeneration. And probably for most of you, that has happened. But maybe for, for some of you here this morning, that's just starting to happen. That life is kind of starting to make sense because God's on the move in your heart. When this transformation is, is in a forward motion in our lives, we begin to care about things that just a little bit earlier in our walk, we cared less about. When Jesus enters our lives and he begins to help us make sense of this new life that he has for us, when that transformation begins to happen, I kind of now become a little bit more sensitive and more caring and more gentle and more loving towards others. Now again, that's not me manufacturing those feelings, those actions. That's Jesus doing his work in my life. Did I just all of a sudden, when I received God's grace and, and found salvation in Jesus, did I all of a sudden just become a completely new person with all new behaviors that were completely God-honoring to, to God-honoring? No. When I found salvation in Jesus, I was eternally, once and for all, justified, declared righteous because of what Jesus had done for me. But now a process begins. And we call that sanctification. And I remember having lunch with uh, Brian one, one afternoon, and I remember him saying, you know, things just kind of, it was the oddest thing. Like, I was hard. I, I, I was, I had tattoos all over my body. Nobody was going to mess with me. And, and, and Jesus started to soften all of that. But he said, you know, I still had this, this issue with my mouth. And, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, but there was still things like that would come out of my mouth that all of a sudden I'm like, you know, that just doesn't feel right anymore. Now, is Brian manufacturing that? No, it's God's spirit changing our hearts. And this change is what we see here in chapter 4. We become more sensitive, more caring, more gentle, but I'm not the one producing this change. It's Jesus, by the work of his spirit, working through the truth of his word, that he starts to mold and shape us. And the different person, the person whose life is being transformed by Jesus, is just going to start thinking different and acting different and making different choices. That's a sign that Jesus is at work in your life. You're not comfortable with the old things. Now some of these new behaviors are what Paul begins to list here before us. And essentially what he's doing here in this section is that he's contrasting again my old life, apart from what 
Jesus can do, that was my old life, with my new life and what Jesus can do as I surrender to him. Now, let's just stop for a minute, take a step back. Let's remember that this letter originally was written to this church in Ephesus. And let's just kind of remind ourselves that, um, you know, it's kind of like this little group of Christians in this island of wickedness and evilness, and, and, and there's this small church, it's located in the center of the city, and, and this city is filled with just paganism and, and evil, and, and, and most of the people who are now hearing this letter being read had no doubt been a part of that paganism that, that kind of just corrupted that city. They probably, most of them, were just part of the activities of that area, that evil, until Jesus did his work in their lives. And what that means, if we think about this, what that means is that every day, the, the, the people in this church in Ephesus are running into old friends. Right? That God didn't completely remove them from Ephesus. They're still there, they're still in the center of the wickedness, but I'm sure they're running into old acquaintances. They're, 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 they're running into people who, hey, they used to go out and get drunk with. They used to party hardy with Friday, Saturday, Sunday night. They're running into people that they did all kinds of evil with. And so they no doubt are continually facing temptation to revert back to those old ways of life, just like we do. Run into some old friends, smell some old smells, see some old things. Boy, it's like a suction cup, isn't it? And Paul, right here, is saying to them, hey, Remember that old way of life that you used to live? He says, can I, just, can I just remind you for a second that that was all built on futility? It was a, it was a futile way of living. There was no substance to it, no purpose, no fulfillment, no satisfaction. You kind of were like this small rowboat out in the middle of a massive hurricane. Could never get grounded. Always going back, thinking that just one more time would, would fill me, would satisfy me. Paul says, listen, your whole life, remember, your whole life was built on deceitful ways of thinking. You were living under the guise of lies and deceit. And so Paul says now, listen, live by the truth. Jesus has planted in you some new desires. And when you surrender your mind to him daily, moment by moment, when you surrender to him, he's going to take the truth of his word and he's going to direct you to that which is satisfying and purposeful for life. You have to pause every once in a while, at least I do, and I have to remind myself that, you know, I, I've been a Christian for almost 53 years, and I have to remind myself from time to time, because I can fall very easily back into legalistic ways of thinking, I have to remind myself that, you know what? Jesus is for me. And Jesus is for you. you know, he's, he's not up there just angry. He's not, you know, up there like the school principal looking, waiting for us to mess up so he can zap us with some lightning, spiritual lightning. Jesus is for us. And he proved that he was for us when he died on the cross for us. And Jesus really wants to fill your life and my life with meaning and 
direction and purpose and, and, and fullness. And in fact, Jesus says he came to give us life and he came to give us abundant life. And he went on to say that when he intervenes in our lives, he does that because he loves us. So Paul here in this letter is reminding us of these things. And notice he is contrasting the old life apart from the new life. And notice here in verse 25, one of the first things he mentions that, that's going to change when, when, when Jesus grasps hold of our souls it, it, is that we're going to want to give up lying. We're not going to want to lie anymore. It says in verse 25, therefore, in other words, since you've been made new in righteousness and holiness and truth, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Now, isn't it interesting that of of all the sins that, that, that he could have started with to make this contrast between the old life and the new life in Jesus, isn't it interesting that the first sin that he's concerned about, that, that, that Christians put away or renounce, is that we ought to be telling the truth to one another. We ought to be telling the truth. To one another. Why in the world would he ever stop there? Jesus, back in John chapter 8, one of the gospels that recorded the kind of the life of Jesus when he was here on earth, Jesus one day said this. He said, The devil is a liar and the father of lies. And he is a murderer from the beginning. You see, what we have to understand is that our whole, our whole world is under the sway of the devil. And so living in deceit, living in falsehood, living in, a, in, in, in this culture of lies really is just accepted. It's expected. It's our practice. Why? Because it's one of the foundational pieces of our lost world. We, we just lie to one another. Now, 1 John 5, 19 says this. He says, we know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So do you see that? Do you see how Satan is really going to sway? He's going to hold on our world. So the first effect of sin in our sinful nature is that we are building lives that are void of truth and chock full of deceit. It's just my natural inclination. The opposite of truth is deception. And the way deception takes root in our lives is that we use it to make ourselves something that we really are not. Have you ever done that? Kind of built yourself up a little bit bigger than you knew in your heart you really are? You see, that's the way we cover over our shortcomings. That's the way we cover over our failures and our faults and our low self-esteem. We all have this vacuum in us. And we want to be something. We want to be accepted. We want others to like us. But none of us are the way we ought to be. And so the way that we begin to craft ourselves into that in our minds is by lying. Lying is the way that we hide wrong with us. And lying is also the way that we avoid consequences that come from our own wrongdoing. You see, I, as I thought about this this week, I, I, I thought lying is really used all the time 
to build up our self-esteem. We, we, we want to be known for someone that we're really not. And, and, and so we kind of just start living in this world of falsehood. And quite honestly, we become so comfortable with it that it's hard for us to change. We fool ourselves. We, 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 we fool others. And this is just a default position of all fallen human beings. And it's consistent with how Satan operates. And then we fall into lying when, as I said, we just don't want to face the consequences of bad choices. And so we deceive, we fabricate, we shade over reality that, so that we can dodge the penalty of our poor decisions. But Paul here is reminding us that when Jesus comes along and invades our life, when he comes and shares his love with us, when we're transformed, when we're made new, truth, hear me, truth begins to win over in those areas of darkness in our lives. Now consistent with that transformation then comes instruction. If you look back at verse 25, it says, therefore, you, therefore put away, here's the instruction, put away falsehood since you have learned Christ. Verse 20, says, verse 20 says, since you have been taught in him. Verse 21 says, since truth is in Jesus. Verse 21 again says, says since you have left behind your former manner of life. Since you have been, verse 23, renewed in what? The spirit of your mind. God's spirit making this transformation. Since you have put on the new self in the likeness of God, created in righteousness and holiness, the holiness of truth. And he says, because that is your reality now, stop lying. Stop Hiding behind deceit. Stop all falsehood and speak the truth to one another. To put away simply means to renounce. To renounce means to literally take this practice off of your life. Well, how do we replace the lies in our life with truth? How do we move from living a life that's built on deceit to living a life that's built on the truth of Jesus? It's interesting, at the end of, of, of Jesus' life, he prays to the Father in heaven, and his prayer is actually recorded for us in John 17, and I just want you to hear how he prays, how he communes with the Father. He says there in chapter 17, verse 13, But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. That they may have my joy. Can you imagine us having the joy of Jesus in ourselves? Verse 14, he says to God, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of them. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Now listen to what he says. Sanctify them, that means set them apart in the, in the truth. Jesus is praying to the Father, and he says, Father, would you just set them apart in your truth. Would you just pick them up, Father? And, 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 and would you just place them in, in the center of your truth? Would you give them a love for your word? Would you, would you create in their hearts this longing to soak themselves in truth? He then says, your word, Father, is truth. And then he says, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. 
You see, Jesus knows that lying and, 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 and living in deceit and falsehood is just going to tear us down. And so he prays that God's truth would become the standard of each one of our lives. And, and, and that God's truth would become the principle by which we live. Now, notice what he says the outcome is when we do that. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world. Now listen, he says, so I have sent them into the world. So here we are again. Jesus doesn't just take us out of this world. He leaves us in the world so that we can begin the practice of these behaviors that are new to us because they are in Christ. And that takes us right back to where we started this morning with the quote that I shared with you. Hear it again. Jesus' resurrection from the the grave is the beginning of God's new project. Not to snatch people away from earth, but to colonize earth with the life of heaven. Now, isn't that interesting? That really helps us understand why we're here. And, and, and what the purpose of our lives really is. We're left here as new creations in Jesus, justified, forgiven, made righteous. We're left here so that we can begin to show the world in our actions and behaviors that there is a better way to life. That there is a new way to life. And man, one of the ways that this world needs to start seeing that is that we who are followers of Christ stand up for truth. That we stand up for truth. And that we're not afraid in love to speak the truth. And, and to put aside Lying and deceitfulness and falsehood. You know, I'm, I'm sure none of us here are like massive liars, massive deceitful kinds of people. I don't. You don't look like that kind of group of people. But every once in a while, I know in my life, a little white lie comes out. Oh, boy, and my conscience gets pricked. Linda will say, hey, did you do the dishes? Absolutely, honey. <laughs> no, they didn't get done, but I get right on them. She's in the car coming home. I get right on them. But then what about, like, our taxes, you know? How many of us try to, you know, get by as much as we can by maybe not completely being truthful with the money we've made. You know, we, we, listen, we live in deceitfulness in so many ways. But what Jesus wants to say to us this morning is, when you step back into that old way of life, listen, it's just futile. It's all built on deceit. You're never going to be satisfied. You're never going to find peace and joy because it's not God's way. So don't leave discouraged this morning. Leave encouraged that Jesus, once again, in his grace, is showing us how to live, not so that we can do better to get him to like us more. No, he's showing us how we can live so that he is honored and glorified and our lives are soaked in the qualities of what makes him him. Love, joy, peace, gentleness. Isn't that what you want for your life? I know that's what I want for mine. So the first practice we need to put behind us is that of lying. Let's stand together and close in prayer.
Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the truth of your word. God, we just thank you again that you're for us. You're not against us. You want, you want what's best for us. And when we live in such a way where we are striving to, to be obedient to you, not only does that fill our hearts with goodness, but it also brings glory and honor to you. It's a win-win situation. And so, Lord, in the days ahead, I, I, I just pray that you continue to transform us. And more specifically, as we've talked about this morning, being men and women of truth and putting behind us the old way of life, which part of that is just being caught up in falsehood and deceit and lying. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.